Good morning, church. Welcome. It's good to be back in church, isn't it? If you are new, we'd like to extend a warm welcome to E5 Church. And also, if you're watching online, we want to say hello to you. And we love, we would love to meet you in person soon. Um, if you are watching online, would you mind giving us a quick subscribe? Subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be really great. Um, 
Thank you to everyone who came to our outreach event yesterday in Broadmead. Can you give us a wave if you were there? <laughs> Tough Talk, we're definitely there. Welcome Tough Talk, everyone. We've got Ian and Joe and Arthur. They shared the gospel yesterday, and we're going to be hearing more from them later on in the service. Um, yesterday, we had uh, people from the church singing, worshiping, doing spoken word. Hashina did an amazing spoken word. Um, we had our youth, Ian, who was rapping. Um, there was so much. Miles was singing. We had a nail bar, which Ann, Amber and Kathy ran. Amber is only 16 but she was so enthusiastic about serving. She just wanted to do something for the day. Um, and we were really blessed by her. And there was such an amazing team who helped organize this event. So I just want to thank um, the team leaders, James, who was instrumental in setup, Brandon, who led the music, um, uh, Rebecca and Liza who were on the kids table and Wayne who made sure that everyone was safe on security as well so I just want to thank everyone who was part of the event and also thank the church as well everyone who came out to support everyone who came out to evangelize we were just there in unity weren't we and we know that where there's unity the Lord commands a blessing that's right isn't it so um, if you are new and you've come, you were out with us yesterday, and you've come today, warm welcome. You can absolutely get a free drink upstairs at the bistro at the end of the service. Um, it's been such a great time in the life of the church. And last week, we all went to the cinema to watch The Chosen. It was an E5 takeover in the cinema, and we had over 100 people watching The Chosen. Isn't that great? If you were one of those 100, can you give us a wave? How was it? Was it good? Yeah, love it. Um, church, I think we're going to pray. We're going to pray now, if that's okay. Can you stand? Oh, I also want to, I just want to say a well done to the E5 Lions team as well. You guys won 3-1, so good job. That's our football team, that's our church football team. They did a brilliant job. So congratulations to you guys. Lord God, we just thank you. We thank you for this day that you have made. We rejoice in it, Lord God, and we are glad. We thank you for the living hope that we have in your resurrected son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you are here, you are with us, you are holding us and uplifting us in your righteous right hand. Father God, I pray that you will bless this service. This service is yours. I ask, Lord God, that you would fill our hearts, that you would search our hearts, Lord God. We want to lift up holy hands to you and pure hearts. We thank you for everyone who's come in here new, Lord God, for the first time. We pray that they would feel welcome, that they would feel at home, that they would feel like they are loved here because you are here, Lord God. We give this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, we serve a good, good God, don't we? We serve a good, good God. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Let's sing that shine Jesus again. Let's break that down. Just shine Jesus. Jesus we are here for you 
The reason we are gathered here is it's because we want to bring glory to your name. I pray that you would move across our time together today, speaking to hearts, speaking to minds. Lord, revealing yourself in this place, revealing your love and your plans and your purposes for every single person, online and in person, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, we have got a special service lined up for you today. We really give a really warm welcome for some of you who are walking into this place for the first time. And I just really, yeah, come on. I really want to make sure that... And I'll say, you know, E5 Church, in the same way you wouldn't let someone walk into your front room unwelcomed or, or, or take in their seat, whatever it might be, that you'll just make a super effort this morning to be just aware that there's people walking in for the first time this morning. Could we just turn to one another and just say hello this morning? Just welcome some people. Not people you know necessarily, just people you don't. Share a name. Great. Welcome, 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 welcome. My name is Pastor Steve McEwen. I'm the lead pastor here at E5. And we've got a great service lined up for you. And not just today, but in the coming weeks as well. Lots of ways that you're just going to be blessed by being together in this way. We have um, a family amongst us. Oh, I wonder if I grab your attention a moment. Hello, hello, hello. We haven't got long this morning. I, I, we have a family amongst us, the Phillips, who I think might be up to the fourth generation of being a part of the life of this church. They have, and you'll know them well because they're engaged in so many aspects and areas of the life of this church. They've been really established in, in seeing this church. It's been 70 years this church has been in existence, but they, for a large part of that, they've been a family which have really blessed the city of Bristol and blessed us and so we're gonna we've got a really special moment we've got one of their youngest members this, this morning being dedicated Lois now I wonder if you come to the stage folks and family and anyone else that's here to pray come on let's put our hands together for Lois <laughs> wow what a beautiful family and, you know, I just really want to honor this, this couple and, you know, those that have gone before, John and Sue, for just the way that they've raised their, their children in the Lord. You know, that's not an easy thing to do. And it's to be admired and respected in these days. And this is what dedication is about. Dedication is an opportunity for us as a church to say that we're alongside you in supporting and encouraging you in the raising of your child. And in order for that to happen, we need to know you. There's a relationship there. But it's also a moment where the parents bring this gift that they have received, that the, this child that they're going to steward and raise and take a moment to say, God, this child belongs to you. For this period, for this time, for this season, I'm going to raise them. I'm going to teach them. And when they're 16, they're going to turn around and probably grunt at me and just say, you know, <laughs> thanks for that. I need some more money. But until that time, we've got stewardship. It's a gift from God. And we're going to do it well. And we're here to say as a church, we want to support and encourage you in that as well. So we're going to take some time just to pray for you all this morning. And... The scriptures are clear. Um, it says this, that like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children born in one's youth. Happy is the man and the woman whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed, 
but shall speak with the en- with their enemies in the gate. There is a strength to a Christian family. I know it's not popular. I didn't come from a perfect family. There are no perfect families, but there are strengths to build in with God at whatever stage of life you are at. Amen. It's true. It's true. So we wanted to take this moment. This is a service of dedication. We're here to give thanks to God, the maker of all things, the giver of life for the creation and the birth of this child. The parents and congregation are to make a solemn promise that we will endeavor to bring up this child in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, relying on God's help in our work together. This is a ceremony which is a biblical practice um, of dedicating this child and saying over to you Lord have your way we're going to speak to the parents in a moment then we're going to speak to those that are partners in our church I know lots of people attend our church but there's those of you that have gone through the journey of partnership with us you've been welcomed into partnership and prayed for we would like you to stand at a certain point in this would you do that for me would you do that for us as a moment of saying this is my signal to say that I'm with you I'm with you, Richard and Joanne, in the raising of this child. We're going to pray and encourage you in that journey. So firstly, to the parents, in presenting this child to the Lord, do you promise independence on divine grace and in partnership with the church to teach her the truths and the duties of the Christian faith and by prayer, teaching and example to bring her up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? You can simply answer by saying, we do. And to the congregation, to the the partners of this church, do you as partners of this church acknowledge and accept the responsibility together with the parents of teaching and training this child so that she might be brought up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord and in due season being led to trust Christ as her own personal saviour, to be made a member of his body? If so, would you stand with me? Partners of this church, would you stand? This is all about relationship. It's about community. It's about us gathering together and encouraging you all on this journey. And I'm going to ask uh, Pastor David if you would just come and pray first. Church, would you like to just extend your hands out towards them, please? Father, we want to thank you for this couple. We thank you for the steadfastness of their walk with you and father for all their involvement in e5 over the years and father we we lift them to you now at this important time in their lives when they've welcomed the third member of their family the third child in their family and father we we thank you for joel and edith and lois and we thank you father that they are a gift from you to them We also acknowledge the fact that they have a stewardship, as we've already heard. And Father, we ask you for a fresh anointing upon their lives at this time. We ask you that, Father, you would give them a a real fresh sense of the call that you have placed on their lives to bring these three precious children up. And Father, we ask you that as the time goes by, you would give them the wisdom, the grace, perseverance maybe the patience too from time to time to bring them up and instruct them in the ways of the Lord Father we want to ask you that they will have a real joy in what you have called them to do and that Father they will grow together as a unit and they will be a family that really are a testimony to your grace and to what you can do in a person's life. And so, Father, we ask you that in their home, you would flood it with your presence. That, Father, every day they will know a real sense of your presence with them, leading, strengthening, guiding them, and that you give them wisdom at every turn, wisdom to make the right decisions for their children. And that, Father, they will truly be blessed by you because we bless them. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I was going to pray for Lois. Father, we thank you for this beautiful, wonderful, beautiful little girl, Lord. We pray your blessing upon her. Lord, we pray your favor over her. Lord, may she grow in favor with you and with all of mankind, Lord. Everywhere she goes, may she experience 
Lord, what it is to serve and to know you for the best, for the very best of what heaven has to offer for her, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus, in the most powerful, wonderful name of Jesus, that she would know that name, that she would come to know you personally, intimately, as a friend, as a saviour, as a Lord, as her King. Lord, may she grow to to be everything that you've called her to be, full of purpose in her life in the days ahead. There's not a day you haven't seen. Your, all, of her, all of her days are written in your book and none will take you by surprise. We pray she grows spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, educationally, relationally. Lord, everything that she puts her hands to, Lord, would see your favor upon it. And she would live a long and blessed life. And many others would come to know you through her. Lord, we thank you for this gift. And in this moment, we dedicate her into your hands and say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, we look forward to seeing what Loris is going to do in your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. Anushka's got some little gifts here for you. And I was going to go for the hold, but I just felt like she was looking at me like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, yes, a nap yet. I knew it was the Lord speaking to me. Lois, have a great day. Have lots of fun. Yeah, bless you all, bless you all. Rich is going to go back and play drums now. Wow. Listen, we're going to go into a time of worship here. Listen, some of you are new to church. You might be going, what is going on here? I wasn't expecting all this noise and it's a bit loud and what's going on? Don't feel pressured. We believe that when we praise and worship Jesus, that he comes and he, he says he moves in that place. And he inhabits the praises of his people. You might want to sit. You might want to stand. You might want to sing wherever you're at. Listen, I believe God is real and he will reveal himself to you. So church, should we just take a little window of opportunity to bless God? Do you know that worship is not for you? Did you know that? I don't know if you know that. It's for him. So shall we bless him? Am I in the right place to bless God? What's going on? All right, so you might want to stand. I think we should stand. Others, if they want, you know, they might want to sit, chill out. I get it, but we're going to bless him. Come on, let's praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just posture ourselves to enter his throne room. Let's prepare ourselves to worship a great God. A God who has proven to be faithful and we can trust him.
I want us to sing on all the earth. I want to hear the congregation and the drums. Let's hear that. And all the earth, Brandon. Help us with that. Come on, church. All right. They got it now. They got it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The very next breath that we have belongs to you. And we'll use it for your glory. We'll lose it to praise you, to give thanks, to acknowledge your goodness on this earth. Every good and perfect gift on this earth, everything we appreciate and value has come from you. So we say thank you. We say thank you. I pray for every person in here today. Lord, that there would be a drawing closer to you, that you would reveal yourself as King, as Saviour and Lord Jesus. Have your way amongst us in your powerful name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I know some of you might be new to this. You're saying, these guys are pretty passionate about this Jesus, aren't they? Yeah, because we're just ordinary people whose lives have been changed. Ordinary people whose lives have been changed by an extraordinary God. So excuse us for a minute if we let, we just let loose for a few moments together and share 
who he is and what he's done. I really hope everyone here is having a great time. We've got lots of ways for you to connect to the life of this church. We're going to take our offering now. So if the team would get ready for that, that would be really helpful. We're going to do it a little bit differently. We're not going to sing a song. We're going to watch a couple of videos um, as we take our offering. Some of you are new to this. You're new to church. Do not feel compelled in any way to, to give. We are still worshipping, believe it or not, as we give this morning. That's how we do it. You might be like, I, I don't know about all that. I didn't come for that. It's fine. You can let the buckets pass by. But for the rest of us that I want to give there's a, um, a place at the back here we can give by a card and the buckets will go around you can go online and see that as well I want us to take a little look first of all at see what happened yesterday in the city centre I want to thank I want to thank James and Summer in particular who just worked so hard and putting together that outreach an incredible job an incredible job some of the best times we've ever had in the city centre what a spot and what a moment to share with people. I want to tell you people are wide open and they got full of favour for the church, honestly. That's what we saw out there. And if you're hesitating in any way to come out in these moments, make sure you do. We can give out the buckets. We can go for it. And if you're not ready to give, that's fine. You let that pass by. But we're going to watch a vid and just um, recount and look back on what happened yesterday a little bit because it was such an amazing time. We've got Tough Talk with us this morning. They were there yesterday and we're going to be blessed this morning. But you really blessed our city yesterday. I want to thank you. You blessed our city yesterday. These guys are from East London like me and I could call it my city now. I'm here. But East London is the Holy Land. I do need to keep reminding you of all of that, okay? East London is where Jesus lives, right? But we were just, it was great to be in that moment with people in the city. Let's have a little look and see what happened. There was dance, there was drama, there was spoken word, the worship team around, and, you know, of course, to some incredible stories of transformation as well. I want to thank everyone that put that together. We're a church here that loves this city, and we love Jesus, and we love telling our stories. That's what we are. We're an accumulation of people all, from all different walks of life. I was saying yesterday we were on Jamaica Street, and everyone's like, and one guy said to me, can only Jamaicans come? I said, no, 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 no. You need to come and see the, see when the church gets together, we're all different sizes and colours and languages and races and, and we let Jamaicans in as well. We do, we let them in as well. We, we're a community that's been changed and we just have to keep talking about that and it was just so blessed yesterday. We've got lots of ways we're doing that over Easter. Next, fr coming Friday is Good Friday and someone said to me last year, do you go to church twice at Easter? What's that all about? Right, times have changed. We go to on Good Friday to recognize the cross. And yeah, I know 
there's lots of reasons to come to church. But in those moments, what's happening is around the planet, Christians are getting together, praying and acknowledging the cross. So being together becomes very significant. You understand? It does something to the planet, I think. And so we gather on Friday, and then on Sunday, we've got a play. These guys have been working hard for weeks with incredible songs and incredible drama production. We've got all the thesps together, the thespians in the church. And we put together an amazing production on the Sunday. And Trudy's back with us. Trudy's back with us for a bit. Now she's so busy. She, she visits the UK every now and then. Well, she's going to be sharing a short word and just inviting people to come to know Jesus. That's on Sunday. So on Friday, 10 a.m., let's have a little look at some of the things that are happening around the life of the church. We've got Alpha coming up as well. Surely he was the Son of God. He was laid in a tomb, sealed with a stone. But on Sunday, as the women went to visit his tomb, there was a violent earthquake. The stone was rolled back. An angel of the Lord declared, He is not here. He has risen. The disciples rejoiced. Hope is assured because hope has a name. Come and join your church family for an afternoon of fun and fellowship on Sunday the 7th of April between 2 and 4 p.m. We're treating ourselves to brunch at the luxurious Cozy Club. Please browse the menu on our website and book your ticket at a cost of £20. But don't delay, spaces are limited. Our Good Friday church service will be held on the 29th of March, starting at 10am. This will be a time to reflect and give thanks as we remember Jesus' death, which made a way to bring us back into a relationship with the Father. We do hope to see you there. Come and see our Easter Sunday production, The Victory, running at both the 9 and 11 a.m. services. This is a great opportunity to bring friends and family giving them a fresh perspective on the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus through drama and song. We are thrilled to have Professor Stuart Burgess with us for our Alpha launch on Sunday the 21st of April, where he will be speaking on the intricate design of the human body. We'll start the evening with a two-course roast dinner. This event is for those who are exploring or who are new to the Christian faith. Spaces are limited, so please book yours now through the church website. All right. I wonder if we can get loads of those blue flyers out, okay, for the Alpha. Please take them away and give them to family and friends on your street, post them through doors. Make sure, uh, if the ushers could just make sure we have those to hand as people leave today. Um, Alpha is an incredible, incredible moment that churches share with, have shared with millions of people around the world where you sit down, have some food, and you ask questions, and you share your point of view, and you're listened to as well. It's not just one-way traffic where you're preached at or talk, spoken to. It's a time to listen, engage with some really important topics about why we're here and who Jesus is and all of that. So we're starting that, as you said, on the on the 21st there. You're welcome to come. Now, I know you're thinking, you're thinking, Pastor Steve's really really eager to keep fit, isn't it? He's getting it in between the sermons. What's going on? This is tough talk. This is how they do it. So we, we've known each other for like 20 years, but I think you've been in it 30. Is that right? 30 years I've been going there. It's 20 years ago that these guys used to come to our youth group and share, and they are 
they, they're an incredible bunch. I really want you to meet them and hear their stories and how they've come to know Jesus and all of that in between. So I wonder if you'd put your hands together and welcome Tough Talk. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Great to be here. Not only church twice in a week, we've been to church twice in a couple of hours. I didn't think this sort of thing happened. I remember the first time I went into a church. It was an evangelical church, and I got there late because I didn't want to be in the front of the crowd. And uh, the guy that was ushering people in put me right in the middle. I thought, oh, no. And then the worship started. I didn't know anything about worship either. The band struck up. And then they started to sing this song. The name of the Lord is... I hate that song. <laughs> and they were belting it out. They were belting it. I remember putting my head in my hands. They thought I was having a quiet moment with the Lord. <laughs> I had an hangover from the night before. Oh, that was a horrible experience. But you know what? Is my wife here? Where's my wife? Jack, let's move to Bristol. <laughs> hey? Do you want a couple of old geriatrics in your church? What a place to come and worship, eh? But you know, for me, what's, what's really been great this weekend, uh, and, and, and as you said, we've known each other for a, a long time, and we've been on the road now. Me and Ian, uh, this is Ian McDowell, by the way. Ian? <laughs> Joe Lamps here. Joe's been with us 25 years. And uh, we've been lifting weights. And Ian, and Ian and I were speaking once. You know, we, we're thinking, though, of changing. We are. Why not? We're going to be called the Tough Talk Vocal Band. <laughs> you see, me and Ian like a bit of country and western gospel. We do. But we're terrible singers. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But what's great for me this weekend, you know, is, is, is being with this church. But, you know, every ship needs a good captain, doesn't they? And there's a captain and his mate sitting right there. And wherever that captain steers, that ship and the crew's going to go. And this is a very professional slick. I mean, look, the lads are lifted on weight. Something's good. But you know what? The church is not for here. This is great to come together and share and worship and praise the Lord. But it's being out there. And that's where we were yesterday. And it was great to be part of that. And, and as we were singing worship this morning, you know, I really did think about that bit in Revelation, you know, when the heavens open. And the rider came down on his white horse and something happened this morning because Jesus is here with us. His angels are here with us. But I think something else happened this morning. I think for little Lewis, I think, you know, there's been an angel anointed and appointed this morning to be with her. You know, so ladies and gentlemen, pray for that angel as well to protect her as she grows. She comes to know the Lord even greater still. So before I continue... Let's have a little bit of scripture, shall we? The pastor brought a word to us as we was praying this morning. It says this, Therefore, we also are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race set before us. 30 years, Ian and I and Joe have been on the road and we're still running. Wow, well, I saw hobble along a little bit with me stick, but we're still going. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, for, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As long as there's breath in my lungs, Ian and Joe get me on the stage and get me off, the church invite us, I'm going to share one thing and one thing only. Christ and him crucified. Okay, why do we lift the weights? We can't sing or dance. Joe was a power lifter. Joe Lampshire is here. Joe lifted twice yesterday. He's done it this morning. He's doing it again this morning. He is such a blessing to me and Ian because we ain't got to do it anymore. <laughs> so keep praying for Joe. Joe's got a fantastic testimony also how he became a Christian gave his life he joined us 25 years ago and there was a couple of times when he sort of wobbled a bit 
And I've got to be honest with you, seriously now. If I, had to, if I was a gambling man 25 years ago, I wouldn't have put a pound on him. I wouldn't. Because the devil didn't like him. Still don't like him. We love him, of course, and we know Jesus does. But he persevered. He set his focus upon Jesus Christ. Joe is now married. He's got two lovely kids. He's got a lovely life. And he loves Jesus Christ. He's got a great testimony. Joe is also a great power lifter. He was British champion, British record holder. He was European champion, Commonwealth champion. That's who you got. You ain't got any rubbish here this morning. He was good. And... Uh, People have asked us, why do we do this? It's simple, as I said, we can't sing or dance. So let's get some rocky music going. Let's get the young turn again. We got the bar 60 kilos. 120 pounds. Get your hands together for Joe Lampshire. Come on. Looking good, Joe. Yeah. Come on. actually said to us we were quite professional in our presentation the way we lift the weights then we give a little bit of a story then we lift some more weights and a little bit more story and then when Ian comes up and speaks he gives a bit of gospel and then we lift a bit more they said oh you know you must have practiced that and we didn't do a thing we just went out lifted the weights told people about Jesus but I really would love to think this well, actually, I don't think it. I know it. I'm convinced of this. Without Jesus Christ in our lives and without his Holy Spirit leading us and strengthening us, we wouldn't have lasted 30 years. People have criticised us over the years. Toxic masculinity. I can't even pronounce that properly, and I'm not even going to try and spell it. Why do you lift weights? This is the devil. We lift weights because we can't do anything else. It's been part of our life. Ian was a bodybuilder. He's going to tell you a bit about his life. Joe, uh, as I said, was a powerlifter. I also was a powerlifter. I competed uh, for 30 years. 1976 was my first competition. Uh, and I trained and competed till 2006. During that year time, I represented Great Britain for 27 years. I was nine times British champion, six times European champion, four times world champion. I broke in excess of 100 British, European, Commonwealth and world records. I was in the Guinness Book. I ain't finished. <laughs> Wait for it. I was in the Guinness Book of Records in 1982. I was elected in the Hall of Fame in 1989. And I've been married to my beautiful wife for 53 years. Oh, there we go. They normally just clap her and don't ignore what I do. <laughs> Powerlifting was part of my God. There was a time in my life, ladies and gentlemen, materialistically speaking, I had everything that you would want. A successful and happy marriage, family, home. I had a successful building business as well, turning over a good few quid back in the 80s. And as I just told you, I had a successful sporting career. A Cinderella sport, but it was my sport. I loved it. So I was travelling around. Lifting weights, I had a good life. Good Things were good for me. But I was never, ever content. Never really, truly found that contentment and peace in my life. I wanted more money, a bigger house, another car, another championship, another world record. Three times in one event, I remember I was lifting. I broke the British deadlift record. Did it once, everybody was clapping. I said, I'll have another go. Did it again, British European Commonwealth record went. And I said, you know what, I feel pretty good this morning. Let's have another go. Three times. I just, broke, I just wanted more and more. Never satisfied. Joe's got on the bar 100 kilos, 220 pounds. So this is getting good. Is it the second time today? Third time this weekend? Fourth time this weekend? Let's hear it for Joe Lampshire. Come on. recommend to you, um, by the way, the Alpha course. I've done 
quite a few alpha courses. When I first became a Christian, I thought it was a great excuse just to get a two-course meal. It was lovely. I love being a Christian. You always get fed wherever you go. It's great. I loved it. And the alpha course, um, which starts on your introduction, is Sunday the 21st of April. And you've got a professor speaking. I'm glad we're not following him. He's a professor. That means he's got a PhD. He's got an MA. He's got a BA. And I don't know how many O-levels and A-levels. We ain't got anything between us. <laughs> We've got a book. Not written by us. <laughs> we even had to get someone to write that for us. I went to night classes to learn to read or write. Oh, by the way, I'll do this little plug. We've got some books for sale. Ten quid. They're at the back somewhere. Over there. And we've got some hoodies for sale. Joe? Joe's modelling one of our hoodies. They're 20 quid. I did notice there's a fella at the back there with a hoodie on. He was at a church a little while ago. And I stood up on the Sunday morning and the minister's got one of our hoodies. I said to him, he ain't paid for that. <laughs> so I'd ask it, And I'm still not sure whether he paid us for it. <laughs> so anyway, we need a bit of diesel money to get home, ladies and gentlemen. Take pity on us. We are a Christian charity. We can't give too much away. Um, but if you want to buy one of our books, our stories are there in a little bit more detail. It's a great thing to share. And like going out on the streets, you know, you don't have to sing and dance. Just be out there. Get some flyers. Give some tracks out. Buy a couple of Tough Talk books. Give them away to people. I had everything that you would want, and yet I never found peace and contentment in my life. Long story short, I got involved in the taking of drugs. Up to this particular time in my life, I never smoked, drank very little, certainly never took drugs. I was a good sportsman, a young man. But like a lot of us, we go down that slippery slope. I became a cocaine addict, become addicted to steroids. I had an adulterous affair, left my wife, deserted my children, lost my business, my homes, my cars, my money. In four years of madness, I lost nearly everything in my life and including my own life. You ready to go again, Joe? Come on, we got 130 kilos on the bar. This is getting heavy. 260 pounds on the bar. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. Come on. Come on, Joe. Joe Lancia. to ending and I'm not being melodramatic when I tell you that. I went to see a doctor in 1992. I had pains in my chest. I thought it was hypertension. This doctor said to me, Arthur, if you continue with the amount of drugs you're taking, you will die. My heart was racing like a Formula One car. It's worn out. It's actually kept together at the moment by two machines and two cables. I'm going in the hospital shortly to have a third machine put in and another cable. So I'm going to have three machines. I'll be able to pick up your internet and all your services on a Sunday morning. I could even have an app put on my phone to control this thing. My missus said, let me have that. <laughs> no way. I've cost the NHS a fortune, but Jesus Christ keeps me going. My drug addiction nearly ended my life. My drug addiction led me into bouts of depression. Some of you may know what depression is like. It's not a nice illness. I saw no way out from my life, and I wanted my life to end, and I tried to take my own life on a number of occasions. I tried to crash the car, tried to overdose, tried to cut my throat, and I tried to drown myself in Tenerife. I wanted my life to end. I saw no way out. My wife actually took me in and back seven times in four years. Wow, what a woman she is. Don't keep clapping, huh? She'd clean me up and I'd walk out on her again until the day she said no more, quite rightly so. Uh, and I believe the day I called out to Jesus Christ, she called out to Jesus Christ. I do believe that there is a spiritual battle going on in this world. I do believe in the things that we don't see sometimes, difficult to understand. But I believe as Christ touched my life and came into my life, he did exactly the same uh, for my wife. We'd been apart for four years. 
one of these same moments, and I didn't have many, I went to see a Christian man who was a counsellor. I didn't like Christians. I didn't go to church. I thought Christian men were wimps anyway, dodgy men wearing dodgy sandals. <laughs> Pastor's called. This is a, he's a smart old fella here, isn't he, this morning? And his missus is a smart one. She, see, see, she dressed him, can't you? <laughs> My idea of a Christian lady, happy, clappy, tambourine bashing Sunday morning. Not much of an image for me. I didn't understand what this was about. Didn't read my Bible. Took me a long time to find out an epistle wasn't married to an apostle. (laughs) Took some saying. But this Christian man didn't preach at me, didn't patronise me, didn't talk down to me. But he said this, you need to choose. And ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter where you are in life. Young, old, rich, poor, man or woman, black or white. You've got choices. And there's a consequence for your actions. We do a lot of work in prisons. And we say the same thing. We say, there's a consequence for your actions, fellas. They all nod. That's why they're banged up. Keep telling them, get yourself another job. You ain't too good at the one you're doing. (laughs) There's a consequence. The consequences of my foolish actions, my drug addiction, has caused my body to deteriorate rapidly. I've got false knees, false hips, bits and pieces stuck in me all over the place. I've had a condition of my heart for 16 years. I'm kept alive by this machine. I'm taking drugs. I'm having more and more operations. That's the consequences of my actions. The body is wrecked, ladies and gentlemen, but the spirit is soaring. Because the devil can rob me of everything in my life. And I was, I've just finished reading Job and I thought, God, oh, blimey. But you know what? He's given me everything in my life. This man said to me, you need to choose. Joe, this is your last one. Yeah, good this stuff. This is the one that Joe's chosen. So let's do it. 130, Here we go, 140 Joe. kilos on the bar. This is a lot Give of Joe. weight. Give Joe that cheer. Come Here on, Joe. Go. Come on. We ain't scared. Here we go. Come on. Up. Here we go, Joe. Come on, Joe. Up, up, up. Come on. Give him a cheer. Come on. Give him a clap. Here we go, Joe. Come on, Joe. Easy. Yeah, come on. There you go. Excellent stuff. There you come go. Come on, Joe. Excellent. Right, I've got to be quick because we're running out of time. What time do we finish? Up past two? Up past three? Yeah, okay. We'll be here a while yet. I've got to rush now because we're going to have a little competition. We want one or two, just literally two blokes. Two blokes. We got two men that fancy doing a bit of bench pressing. Oh, we got one. Right, we want one more. Just one bloke. Come on at the back there. Come on then. Just two. Another. Yeah, just stand there a minute. Yeah, let's have one more. Come on. Yeah, that's it. We got three fellas. Come over here. Excellent stuff. While they're setting up, I'm going to finish. I've actually gone on a little touch too long this morning. I made a choice. 30 years ago, I was in a car park in the East End of London. My life was in a mess. My life was close to ending. And I wanted it to end. I saw no way out. And I just stood there and I just said, you know what, if there's such a thing as a God, come on, sort me out. Now, there was no booming voice, no choir of angels, and the heavens didn't open to me that morning. But something happened in me. For the first time in my life, I remember looking into the darkness, and I've been scared of my life. Scared of the dark all my life. My wife will tell you about this. I was scared of the darkness all of my life. And I remember looking into the dark thinking, you know what, I can see. For the first time, I could see. I stopped my drug addiction that night. I started to go to church. I started to read my Bible. I started to pray. And my life started to change. Some of you may or may not believe this morning. Some of you may think I'm absolutely crazy and bonkers. But ask yourself this question. Am I telling you a bag of lies or telling you the truth? If I'm lying, what gain do I get? I'm not a double-glazed salesman. So I'm getting nothing out of this. But this is what you can't argue against. This is the truth of my life. From the moment I cried out to God, from the moment I put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ, from the moment I opened this book and realized this had been written for me. Pastor said, we're just ordinary men. Great it is. But this book tells me something different. It says I'm a child of God. 
He said, I'm adopted in his family. He said, I'm a co-heir to the throne of God. Do you believe that? Then claim it. My life turned around. My wife and I were apart for four years. We got remarried in 1993. I have the love and respect of my children. I've been clean for 30 years. I have everything that I need in my life, not necessarily everything that I want. I want a BMW 7 Series. Anybody in the BMW dealership here? <laughs> Never mind. Jesus Christ came into my life and turned my life around. You have a decision to make. Those of you that believe you have a decision to make whether you're going to continue following him. Keep following him. If you've never made that decision, you have a decision to make. So ask him. Because life can be over like that. I'm sure of three things now, ladies and gentlemen, in my life. I have forgiveness of my past. I have a peace in the present. And I have a hope for the future. When I drop off the perch... And there's not many candles left in my box, that's for sure. But when I drop off the perch, I know where I'm going. I'm going to be in glory with Jesus Christ. We're going to have a bench press. Thank you for listening. Okay, Joe's just going to demonstrate. Oh, yeah, Joe demonstrate. Right, we're going to do a bench press, fellas. Okay, so watch what he's doing. He will lift it in for you. We'll lift it in. <laughs> Give him a clap. What's your name? Crassy. Crassy. Right. Crassy. Give Crassy. him a big clap. Has Crassy got any friends? Let's have some yeah, music. Yeah, let's hear it for... Come on. Give him a clap. Give him a cheer. Come on. Come on. Take your time. My friend. And press. Push. Come on, yes. One. There we go. Come Two. on. There we go. Three. Come on. Give him a cheer. Come on. Oh, let's get... Take it up four. Come on, young man. What's your name? Jordan. 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 Yeah, he's, he's, he's a strong old lad, isn't he? He's in good shape. Let's give him hey. a clap. Here we go. Good looking. Come on, Jordan. You can do it, son. Come on, Jordan. Yep. Here we go. Give him a cheer. One. Come on. Two. Two. Three. Whoa. Four. Come on, 18, come on, get 20, come on, one more, come on, come on, Jordan, big break, ooh, yeah, very good, I'm impressed, I'm impressed. Fantastic, very well. I ate him even more now, I can only do about six, I'm only joking, all right, hey, last man, sorry, where's your name? Jack. No, Jack, Jack looks a bit chunky as well. Bit... He's got some big fellas here in Bristol. I ain't coming to this church, they're too big. Come on, Jack, let's hear it. Come on, let's hear it for Jack. One, two, three, up. Ooh. Come on. Four, five, six, seven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Let's give him a prize. And we've right. got two prizes for oh, our winner. Come here, guys. Come, 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 come. We've got some prizes to give out. We've got... Let's get the winner in the middle there. We've got Raise a, ch the we've got we a go. chocolate Easter egg, orange flight. I don't think he eats You can eggs, just mate. have a book. There you go. There's a prize. There's one from the church for you, son. 
And there's our ball. Well done. Give them all Give a clap. Give them a clap. They were awesome. Come on, they've done well. There you go. Fantastic. Well Come on. Guys. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm strongest men of Bristol. Bless you. Cheers, I want to introduce you, you to Ian McDowell. Mate, Ian's going to finish off this, this morning's session. Thank you, Ian. Well done, guys. Yeah, good. Excellent. Give Arthur and Joe a big clap. <laughs> so I'm going to share very, very quickly with you a little bit about my story and how I come to faith. And uh, I grew up in East London. They're the best football club in the country, West Ham United. <laughs> Rubbish. Who said that? What do you mean, boo? What are you booing at? What's West Ham ever done to Bristol, I keep thinking? I remember I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. I'm one of seven kids, and we've all got different dads. My mum, bless her, she always took things to the next level in everything she did. And uh, she didn't just have one dog, she had like 15 dogs. And uh, she was that kind of crazy character, if you know what I mean, that you meet. And uh, uh, got very heavily involved in the occult, witchcraft, spiritualism. She loved all that sort of stuff. I remember one particular day... Uh, me and my brother decided to hang my little brother upside down on the, the balcony, on the banisters. And uh, he was still in these nappies and we tied him up and we was hanging upside down. Mum come out screaming at us to get him down. And my, my brother was screaming, my mum was screaming. And one of my other brothers thought this was great. And he came behind us with a, a tea towel uh, and he turned it into a whip. And he started whipping us. So we were screaming, he was screaming. The dogs were kicking off. They were barking, everyone was screaming at each other. At that moment, the doorbell rang. And uh, my sister, bless her, she used to have learning difficulties. She never ever used to open the door or answer the phone. And uh, at that moment, she said, she thought because everyone was busy, she'd open up the door. And my mum used to have this sign above the door that used to say, um, uh, beware of the kids. And so she's opened up the door, and there was a lady at the door, and uh, I think she might have been reading the sign, because uh, my sister said her eyes were going funny, so maybe she was, like, concentrating on the words and, uh, uh, and reading the sign. My sister opened up the door, and she literally looked at this woman and just started screaming at her because her eyes freaked her out. She just started screaming. And the woman's looked in at this girl screaming at her, a boy hanging upside down in his nappies, being tied to the banisters, mum screaming, dogs barking and biting each other, my brother whipping us. And it's a true story. She just fainted on the doorstep. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> mum said, we went silent, even the dogs stopped barking. We all looked at her. Mum said, quick, grab her, drag her in. She might be a social worker, you know? Found out she was part of the Avon and just selling a few. <laughs> we got away with it that day, you know, and uh, my life was out of control, maybe because of the, my lifestyle I grew up in. And uh, I remember as a young man, I got heavily involved in anabolic steroids like Arthur, and uh, I got involved in bodybuilding. I remember sitting in the gym one day, there was this guy, they used to call him Mad Dog, scary bloke, actually probably the ugliest man I've ever seen in my life. He all scarred up face, chewed up ear, no tooth. He said, son, do you want to work me on the door tonight? They used to call them bouncers, didn't they, years ago? They're called door supervisors today. I remember looking at him thinking, not if I end up looking like you, you know? <laughs> he said, I'll give you a double bubble, boy, if you come to work with me. He picked me up from the club, and I remember uh, he took me to this, uh, uh, this bar that particular evening, and um, we're sitting outside the club. Now you have to have a license to be a doorman. Did you know that? And, and you get regulated by the, the uh, Office of Fair Trade, or where it is, there's all this sort of stuff going on. You get a license and you get uh, uh, vetted by the police. Health and safety. Pay a bit of tax to be a, a doorman now. And uh, none of that happened in those days. He, and we, uh, sitting in the car, he said, here, son, stick this in your jacket. You're going to need it later. And he gave me like this small truncheon. And I remember putting my coat, thinking, what have I got myself into? He said, here, I'm going to introduce you to your colleagues, the guys you're working with. We walked up to the store. He said, this is Dave the bus. I'm like, oh, Dave, how are you, mate? <laughs> he said, this is one-eyed Mark. I'm like, what am I getting myself involved in? And I found myself working in this gang that had come out of something called the ICF, and the, a football hooligan organisation that were running clubs and bars and pubs in East London at that time, and Essex. And uh, my life spiralled out of control. 
I'm ashamed to say I got involved in a lot of violence, a lot of crime, hurt and upset a lot of people, turned my back on many people. Life just has a way of just uh, taking it out, doesn't it? And uh, we call ourselves tough talk because life is tough, isn't it? I remember getting involved in a fight in a nightclub out in a place called Ilford. And uh, we came off worse that night. It was a fight with another group of doormen. I got squirted with ammonia in my face, ended up in hospital. And there was a pal of mine that night who got smashed to bits with a pickaxe handle and they nearly killed him. He ended up in hospital with me. He was there, he was there a week or so. I got out the next day. And this guy's name was Ez Katel. Ez and me used to do a little business together during the day as well. It was a little bit of debt collecting. And uh, I couldn't get hold of Ez. I went around to see him because he wasn't answering his phone. He took me upstairs, was sitting in his room, and he's telling me how bad his life is. He said, Ian, I can't see out of my eye properly. They've damaged the retina at the back. I can't hear out of this ear. Look at the state of my jaw. I'm on liquid food. Look at the hole in my jaw there. It was all wired up. They put plates on him. And, and as he was talking to me about the pain he was suffering and the anger he had in his heart, how he wanted his revenge, he did something I wasn't expecting. He just suddenly broke down and started to cry. Now, I'm not a comforting, counselling sort of bloke. I don't like hugging and all that sort of stuff. I'd never make a pastor. I'm not a, I'm just, I do like people, you know, like, but I wouldn't be a pastor sort of a fella. Uh, and I didn't know what to say. This guy's crying in front of me. He's a naughty, nasty bit of work, about six foot four, six foot five, sells guns in East London, and he's sitting there crying. And I remember these words coming out of my mouth. I remember looking at him and saying to him, why don't you come to church with me? I thought, where did that come from, you know? He's gone, church, Ian, ain't not got enough problems as it is. What are you talking about church for, son? I said, listen, please don't think I've joined the God Squad or become a Bible basher. I was embarrassed. I thought, what am I talking about? You see, I wasn't a Christian. And I remember saying, look, recently I had these nightmares about God and a pal we know on the door took me to this church in Canning Town. It happened to be an alien Pentecostal church. I thought it was a cult. I didn't know what was going on. They, were, they called people at the end that had sicknesses and mental health problems and, and issues. And they were putting their hands on these people and praying for them. So I told my friend this story how these people were helping people that were in trouble. I said, maybe you want to get yourself down there. He's looking at me like confused, you know. I thought I'm going to get out of here quickly while I still can. So see you later, pal. A few nights passed, I was a head doorman in a club out in North London. A car pulled up, three very dangerous individuals in that car. One of them was my mate, Ez. He took me round the corner of the club and he said, Ian, he said, uh, he said, and he went over the same stuff, the pain, the agony, the, the depression, the head, the pain. He said, Ian, he, he said, and he started to break down again. He said, Ian, it's suicide or church. That's how hard it is for some men to get to church, Pastor. So it's hard to church. I said, if it's that bad, I'll take you there myself. For why did I say that? I'd never, I never already vowed I was never going back again. I didn't like the place. I thought the Christians looked brainwashed, you know? Didn't like the music or anything like that. In fact, there is a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. And when that darkness enters into that light, it can't, it doesn't like it, it doesn't feel right. God is light, and in him is no darkness. The Bible says, cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. We're children of light, and we cannot, the darkness struggles in that environment. And I remember literally, uh, uh, he's standing there, and I, I, he's saying, suicide or church? I said, listen, I'll pick you up and take you there myself. I took him to this church, and at the end of the meeting, instead of a Praying for anyone, they start giving us cups of coffee. I'm standing having a cup of coffee. This geezer, Tony, telling me I'd become a Christian in prison. Started inviting us to this other meeting during the week. I thought, church twice in one week? <laughs> do they do that, these fellas? I said, no, I'm, not, I'm okay. I'm thinking I'm never coming back again. I don't like this. My pal went, oh, I have some of that, Tony. I have some of that. It was a place they went to called Kensington Temple in Notting Hill Gate. They went to walk into this place. Now, on the journey there, Tony was saying to my powers, there is a God, and this God can heal you, but you've got to forgive the people that have done this. Now, as at this time, I'd arranged for the date that these fellas were going to get shot. And he was like, he didn't tell them that, but he was full of anger and unforgiveness. And he thought about what Tony was saying to him. He said, hey, and as I went to walk in that building, I thought, God, if you're real and you can help me, I'll forgive him. I believe only the Holy Spirit gives us that ability, personally. Something touched it, 
of God touched Ezra that moment. He sat in the back there. There was an American guy I found out. His name was Charles Slagle. Charles had this prophetic ministry, a word of knowledge ministry. He got my friend to stand up. He's a six foot four nightclub doorman, a gangster from East London, never really been to church before. And he's got this guy from America talking to him about the injuries, the fight, and all the pain he was suffering. He said, Ian, I thought someone had slipped him a few quid. I didn't know what was going on. He said, then he said this, he said, he said, son, the Lord wants to say to you, thank you for forgiving the people that done this to you. He said, a chill went up my back. He said, I thought, I haven't told anyone that. How does he know that? He said, receive your healing now in Jesus' name. He said, Ian, people started putting their hands on me. I felt I was suddenly plugged into electricity. I felt this heat rushing through me. I felt a tingling in my eye, a popping in my air, a movement in my jaw. He said, I've sat down, a smell was coming off of me. I believe he was being delivered at that point. He said, I went out of that church. He said, I thought, I'm going to try and eat. He said, I started to eat. He'd been on liquid food. Since the accident, he said, I started to eat a meeting. All I know is I was working on the door that night. I got home, the phone rings my powers. Ian, Ian, Jesus has healed me. <laughs> now, I didn't clap and shout amen. <laughs> I thought he's had a little bit too much rum, done a little line or something. I thought you'll be all right tomorrow, pal. I went round to see him the next day. He took me up. He told me the story I just told you. The difference was I could see he looked different. I could see the swelling was gone. I could see his teeth were together. But I couldn't believe it. I thought, there's there's no such thing as God. And if there's a God, he doesn't heal people. And if he does heal people, why would he heal someone like him? You know, God, there's nice people needed to be healed. This is a nightmare, this geezer. And it got worse for me. Went around telling my pals, Ian took me to church. (laughs) And Jesus healed me. I pulled him aside and said, it's good for you, Ed, but you want to keep me out of the story, please? (laughs) He didn't. He wrote a book called I'm Asking You Nicely. He's got this big picture of him on the front. He's now a minister uh, uh, working with people that don't normally go to church in East London. (laughs) I'm out on bail. I've got a seven-year prison sentence hanging over my head. I'm full of steroids pumping the gear in me. I remember sitting in my car, just covered in blood. I just had a row on the door. And I just started to think about my power. I thought about the dreams I had. And I remember thinking, God, if you're there, if you're really real, if there is a God, can you sort me out? Can you stop me? I felt suddenly guilty for the fight I'd been involved in. And I said, Jesus, would you forgive me? For what I've become. At that moment, I felt this incredible sense of peace and like love, just layers of love just flowing through me. I remember sitting in my car in tears in my eyes in the North Circular around, that goes from North London to East London, four or five o'clock in the morning with a bag of steroids in the back, a gun in the boot of the car. That night, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, touched my heart. I went home that night. I had a miracle. I, I fell asleep. I used to sleep with a carving knife under my pillow out of fear. It would come through my door with my hand permanently on the handle because I live with paranoia and fear but that night I've, and I used to have voices in my head swearing all the time I thought it was just me but that night this darkness lifted from me he's able to deliver us why he's the king of glory he's the Lord God almighty he's the rider on the white horse who's faithful and just and true he's more than we can ask or imagine he's the lion of the tribe of Judah he said I am the way the truth and the life he said I'm the light of the world he is able to deliver us that day I woke up the next morning I felt born again I didn't know what was going on in my head but I felt different inside I thought I'd better get back to that church in Canning Town I went down to that church and I walked in thinking I was going to want to run like I usually felt when I went there because of the music and, and I thought everyone was brainwashed but I remember going in and looking around at the Christians and thought actually these are quite nice people what was my problem and then the music started, and, and they were singing this song, and the words went like this, something like this. You laid aside your majesty. You gave up everything for me. You suffered at the hands of those you had created. You took all my guilt and shame when you died and you rose again. And I realized at that point, I started to understand through the worship, the gospel, that God The one who lives outside of time, space, and matter entered into time, space, and matter for us. That he died upon the cross for my sin and my shame. 
He was the Lamb of God, perfect. He shed his blood, Emmanuel's blood, that I would be saved. I remember standing there singing that song with tears in my eyes. Is it easy being a Christian? No. I've been through hell and back in 30 years, but I would never want to go back to the insanity of the madness of my mind and the way I used to live. It's not easy. I remember telling my mum, Mum, I've become a Christian. She looked at me and said, I think you've been hitting the head too many times, boy. She phoned up my brothers, keep away from Ian. He's got religion. It's like a disease in East London, you know. <laughs> Even on the door, I turn up, hallelujah, brother, I've seen the light. But you know what? I've been shot at, spat at, people pulled out knives on us on the door, but I still kept going back to work. We would go on the streets up and down this country. We've had things spat at us and thrown at us and abuse shouted at us, but we still go out there. Why? Because it is a truth worth standing for. There's a spirit in this country that isn't the same around the rest of the world, particularly in Europe and particularly in the UK. It's like we've been vaccinated over here, but this is a spirit of intimidation that makes us want to be ashamed to stand for the gospel. When the church gets out on the street, guys, get out with them. Be bold in your faith. We had a fantastic day yesterday, and it makes such a difference when you go out with the body of Christ and just stand there. The atmosphere was dominated on the streets of Bristol when they started to worship, when they started to praise Jesus. And the boldness came upon people, and the people on the streets couldn't understand, but the light was shining. It made it easy to preach the gospel out there. I want to finish with this story. I'm... Uh, going to take you very quickly to a prison I was at in South Africa with Arthur and myself a few years ago. So we travel up and down the country in different countries. We're off to Liverpool on Monday doing schoolwork. I mean, that's scary, isn't it? But we preached in Rikers Island prison and places like India and Hong Kong and across Europe, Russia and Ukraine, all sorts of places. And uh, I was in South Africa with Arthur a few years ago, working with the numbers gangs. We was in this particular prison, and we were sharing the story. And there was a guy at the front put up his hand, and he said, I've got a question for you. I said, what is it, mate? He said, I want to be a, a Christian. I believe in everything you've said. I believe that there is a God. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died upon the cross. He died and rose again. I believe all this. I believed it for my life. He said, but I, I know that if I become a Christian, I won't be alive in the morning. And I said, that's a bit serious, mate. Why is that? He said, I run the gang in this prison, the numbers gang. And he said, if I renounce the gang and turn from the gang and repent of my sins and turn and follow the cross, they will take my life during the night. What have you got to say to that? And I remember thinking, well, that's not an easy thing to answer, is it? You know, like, how do I answer that? I've come here because I believe that the Bible says, fix not your eyes on what is seen, but what is unseen. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Fixing my eyes on the eternal things because we're more than just matter and body. We're spiritual. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know how to answer because I don't want to be the one that brings him to die that night. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's where I was at. And... And, and, and as I was puzzled with this, thinking, I've got to come out with something, my pal Arthur said, Ian, do you mind if I answer that question? I said, yeah, please do, Arthur. So, all yours, go on. He stepped forward, he said, son, it's like this. Oh, metal shoulders, metal hips, metal knees. I've had five or six operations on my heart. I've been told I could die at any moment. Heart attack or stroke. He cracks jokes to me all the time about, uh, uh, you know, if I pass away today. I never know if he's going to answer the phone. He could be gone, you know. I know he's going to be in glory, so I'm not that worried about it. In a nice way. I remember him saying, I could die at any minute, boy, but I'm in a win-win situation. He said, because if I live, I'm going to be with the Lord. And if I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. He says, son, it's better to be with the Lord. We all live inside a body. The body is just like a house, like a tent. The real human soul lives within that. Our bodies are going to pass from this world. From dust we've been, been created, from dust we'll go. But we will stand before our maker. It's been appointed once for man to die and then face the judgment seat of Christ. He said, we will stand before our maker. And I've made peace with God through trusting in Jesus Christ. 
and what he'd done on the cross. We bowed our heads that afternoon with this fellow and the other guys there. With tears, this guy prayed the prayer with us to come to faith. People have said to me, did he live? Well, I believe there's a God of the living, not the dead. I think the eternal things are more important. The more I thought about that moment. The Bible says in Hebrews, he's able to save to the uttermost. The very uttermost. I believe that with all my heart. The scriptures tell me that the wages of sin is death. The payment for your sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I believe that there's a way that seems right to man. His path leads to death and destruction. The soul that sins descends into utter darkness. We don't know where we're going. There's chaos out there. If only we knew that there's a path that the Lord shows us, the right path, where there's at his right hand fullness of joy, his right hand is pleasure evermore. But we shrink back in our nakedness because we are ashamed of our sin because the Bible says even calling your brother a fool you're in danger of hell's fire and we fail to trust in the accomplishment of the cross his nakedness upon that cross covers us the blood that was shed covers our sins that our, our relationship can be restored I'm going to pray a very quick prayer I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me this is a prayer that we pray for those guys that day It's a prayer, just an invitation to the cross. There's a holy God. And our sins and the things we do that we just thought were normal, natural human behavior, the swearing, using God's name as a cuss word and it's blasphemy. Anger, like murder, Jesus said. Having lust in your heart. It's like fornication and adultery all guilty before a holy God the standards of God are far beyond our standards but we know them because he's written them in our heart and we judge other people by them but yet we always say Do you know I'm a nice person I'm not too bad I've done okay I'm not as bad as that fella you don't have to be like Arthur and myself and Joe Joe was heavily caught up in witchcraft you don't have to have gone down those paths to need a saviour. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. I'm going to ask the church to pray this out loud after me. Maybe you're backslid and maybe you just know that there's a coldness in your heart. You're not sure where you're at. You've been in church. You've grown up in church. You don't know if you was to die today where you'd be. You don't know if you really believe this message. Your head can't get around it. It just seems like a story to you. You don't really know Jesus Christ. Sin does entangle us. I want to say to you, behold, now is the day of salvation. The Bible says if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, God raise him from the dead, we shall be saved. Maybe you're going to pray this for the first time. I'm going to encourage you to pray it out loud. So church, pray this out loud after me to encourage those that have never prayed before, maybe never said this kind of thing before. And at the end, we're going to say amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for us. Forgive us of our sins, the things we've done wrong before you. We repent and turn to the cross. Come in our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Every head stay bowed, every eye closed. In this moment, the Bible says that we are standing on holy ground. There are angels all around. There's a presence here right now of, of his presence. The Bible says these eyes roam to and fro across this world, searching our hearts and minds. He knows each and every one of us, everything we've done, everything that's gone wrong for us, everything that we've said that has been bad. And he's prepared to forgive you today because of the accomplishment of what he did on the cross. Trust in him. If you prayed that prayer in any way, getting right with him or for the first time, I want to pray for you and say a blessing over you while you're sitting in your chair. If that is you, quickly raise your hand for me so I can see you and pray for you. God bless 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 you. 
If that is you, you know right now you're, you're, everyone's head is bowed. You know that is you. Quickly raise your hand if you haven't raised it. I want to pray for you. Anybody else, quickly raise your hand. I, God bless you at the top. God bless you at the top. God bless you, sir. God bless you, my love. God bless you at the top, my friend. God bless you at the front. God bless you. I think what we do, what we're going to do is actually I'm going to ask everyone to stand. There's been a lot of people responding today. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. I'm going to ask you to be very bold, really. I'm going to, we want to pray for you. We want to talk to you. I'm going to ask you to do something that's very un-British. I'm going to ask you just to come to the front so I can pray a prayer over you. Come to the front. If you've raised your hand, and there's a number of you, even if you're in the top of the balcony, come to the front. I want to pray for you quickly. Come down. The front, the back, at the top. Push people out of the way. I saw a number of hands at the back there at the top. Please come. As they're coming, I'm going to pray. Keep coming, I want to pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you would touch these people. Father God, we just pray by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, you protect the seeds that have been sown today. For we know the Word says that the devil comes to steal those seeds. And we just pray for the precious blood to touch and protect their souls. Lord, give them a desire to read your words, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Give these people a big clap. If you haven't yet come down, please come down. The members here would love to just talk with you and pray for you. Why that is happening and why the church takes care and prays and shares with these guys, I want to pray very quickly with the congregation that's standing. I want to pray for you Christian people out there for one or two minutes very quickly for the boldness to evangelize. If you know, if you know that you're ashamed to go out and confess, you struggle you honestly struggle to share with your neighbours, your loved ones, your friends, how to communicate. Maybe you just know that you need that boldness. I want to ask you to raise your hand for me. I want to pray for you if that is you. Thank you. Bless you. Quickly raise your hand if you know you need a touch from heaven to be able to evangelise and touch people and reach the gospel. Heavenly Father, we just pray for all those that are raising their hand right now. Let your boldness, you are the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You're the King of glory. Touch them, oh God. Fill them with a passion for your gospel. Fill them with a desire that they would no longer be ashamed. I command and demand that the, imitate, the Spirit in, intimidates us to be lifted from them right now. In Jesus' name, we declare the boldness over them. In your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless you guys. We're going to hand you back to our pastor, Steve. We're just going to take our time at the front here and pray for the, these folks that have come forward. And there's others of you, I know, that you're stood there right now. You know, you know that you want to respond. Don't let anything stop you. Don't let anything stop you. You know, you make sure you come to the front. We would love to just talk with you and pray with you for a moment. Give you a Bible and share a little bit about how to, we could help, how we might be able to help with the way forward. Don't walk out the door if you know that's so you. Come to the front, we're here. And we're just going to keep this space really free. And please don't walk across this space. Be really respectful of this space here. Have you appreciated Tough Talk today? We're going to have, um, if the ushers could just make sure they're available with uh, the buckets on the way out as well. We'd really like to make sure that if you've got an opportunity to give to Tough Talk, we want to bless them for the amazing ministry they have. We're here Friday, 10 a.m. for good, just one service, Good Friday, and then two services Sunday with 9 and 11. Teas and coffees upstairs. You just go up this way and up the stairs, and a free tea and coffee for anyone that's new. God bless you all. God bless you all. Have an amazing Sunday. God bless you. If you want to be prayed for, please come to the front now. We'd love to have a chat with you. Um, there's some guys here, I believe. There's, um, we need a few men from the church. If you could just come. If you're a, a guy, you can give us 20 minutes of your energy. Ladies as well that are, are able to just lift. We've got to clear the stage for next Friday and Sunday. So if you could just come here, if you're willing to help out for the next 20 minutes or so, just come and meet Dan. Dan will be here, okay? So just come. If you've got 20 minutes to help us pack down, we'd really appreciate that service to Jesus. God bless you.